Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Nazarene Talk. I'm Pastor Kevin, and we have evolved into a different type of a timeline this morning. And with me this morning, I have a gentleman that we brought in. You probably do not recognize him, but I'd like to introduce to you Jeremiah. Jeremiah, thanks for coming in, and yeah. thanks for joining thanks us. Thanks for having me. One thing I noticed this morning, uh, Pastor Kevin, is that uh, I age extremely well, and um, apparently you don't. Well, let me let me tell you what happened. Um, because it's been I about was, 20 I, years since we've been I on the was, show. Uh, <laughs> I was experimenting with, with some gaming consoles over the weekend, and, you know... It, I should have paid attention to Ghostbusters when they said don't cross the beams. Oh yeah. And when I did that, it accelerated me into a different time zone. And I'm still a little fuzzy from it all, and I'm not really quite sure exactly what to do, uh, but I'm pretty sure we can reverse this process by next week. Okay, we'll do it. And And I'll be back to normal. All right, that'd be good. But for the meantime, we have a show to do uh, because we got a lot of people that are counting on us to be here every week. So <laughs> regardless, we had to be here uh, even though the crossing of the beams and the time warping. So That's it. You know, and, and it's interesting because, you know, I, I got this this thing years ago, you know, for as a Father's Day gift. And I thought, well, Father's Day's coming up. And I started playing with it and since we make it more advanced and, you know, some things that were meant to be left alone, but other things, curiosity gets the best of you. Oh yeah. And it can work in so many different regards on that. <clears throat> Even in a, a normal life of uh, a pastor, mm -hmm. your curiosity as a pastor of different things and the challenges that you have to face uh, and the, the different variety of all those people, which leads me to a question. Um, what made you decide to become a pastor? Well, it, it's, it's very interesting because, um, you know, becoming a pastor, uh, I don't know if it was, was much of a decision for me as much as it felt um, like a calling. And I remember being in the eighth grade, and I was um, out in my garage working out uh, because I wanted to get buff, I wanted to be strong. And I remember having this conversation with God out of nowhere. And, um, and I remember the Lord telling me, I want you to be a pastor. I want you to um, be a youth pastor. I want you to go and, and do all these incredible things. And, and I'm sitting there punching my makeshift punching bag, having this conversation. And uh, I remember there was a George Strait song on the radio. And it was, uh, uh, I believe it was Keeper of the Stars. Is that a George Strait song? Keeper of the Star? Yeah. I tip my hat to the Keeper of the Stars. I think it was George Strait. That was the song mm -hmm. that was on. And, um, and I remember having this conversation and, and telling the Lord, well, I don't know if I want to be a pastor because I think I want to be a country music singer. Mm -hmm. And I want to sing country music my whole life. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I just remember the Lord saying, you know, that's not going to make you happy. You know, it's not going to be what, that's not what you were made for. That's not what you were built for. Uh, that's not what you were designed for. He said, I want you to be a pastor. And, and by the end of that workout, I said, okay, if that's what you want me to do, that's what I'll do. And how old were you when this actual experience happened? Well, I was in the eighth grade, so I was about 14. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's fairly young then. Yeah, I was pretty young. I was maybe, I think it was probably 14. And, um, and from that point on, you know, I, I just, kind of had it in my in my crosshairs that's, that's what I was going to do and so um, as soon as I graduated high school I went to a Christian college up in Kansas City where um, where I studied the ministry the Nazarene and, College there mm -hmm. in Olathe Mid American Nazarene University yep I used to live near there so I know it really? very well yeah yeah it's 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 changed quite a bit I'm sure it has they have they have added an, an incredible amount of other buildings and facilities and things like that and it looks great and so I went and I got my diploma um, and you know even even while I was in high school you know I, I I remember the Lord just leading me to hone up my skills 
Um, I remember being in, in the ninth and 10th grade and uh, knowing that I was going to be a preacher when I grew up. And so I would ask churches and, mm -hmm. you know, VBSs and, hey, can I preach at your VBS? Can I preach at your children's church? Can I preach at, and, you know, I got several opportunities to go and do that. I remember one time uh, when I was in high school, I was part of a traveling music group because I still love to sing. And I was part of a traveling music group, excuse me, and I made it to a, uh, to a church in Missouri. I think we were in Branson. And, and as we were ministering over there, um, I remember uh, just, just giving a really simple sermon. And, and my first experience at, at what God could do um, you know, through me in the ministry just blew me away. I was probably 15 or 16 at the time, mm -hmm. and I gave this message. And, and out of nowhere, you know, 25, 30 people came and, and, you know, came down to the altar and prayed. And some of them given their heart to the Lord. Some of them just given certain issues in their life to the Lord. And, and it was powerful. And so I just knew. And uh, throughout high school, I was highly involved in, in ministry. And throughout college, I interned at multiple churches and, and uh, helped out with multiple things. And, and here I am today. So now when you made those Branson trips uh, in your youth group and when you were a teenager, I'm guessing you also went up to Arkansas to the um, the Passion of the Christ we and did. all that. We and, did. Uh, we actually big, uh, crosses. We actually took a uh, a trip. I wanted to, it's probably somewhere between my sophomore and junior year. Our youth group decided that we wanted to go and and actually do um, kind of a a one day mission at a church, and so we planned an entire um, service. And we called a church down in Berryvale, Arkansas. Do you know where Berryvale is at? Uh, nope. I know about Mayberry. There you go, Mayberry. <laughs> well, I, I don't even know where Berryvale is at. I just remember the name. And and we went down, and and it was the same thing. Uh, you know, I got to preach that Sunday, and, and it was a full house, and I was as nervous as I'll get out and probably made absolutely no sense. Uh, yeah. But it was good. And... Um, and you know we had we had a great time and we did we got to go to the passion play that weekend and Eureka Springs right yes yeah yeah so we were we were loving it we were loving life and just living for the Lord and and doing ministry so um, you know it kind of reminds me of of the prophet Jeremiah out of the Bible when mm -hmm. um, you know when the Lord called him as a as a young boy and and uh, life was just completely marked by ministry and. And that's, for the most part, how it's felt for me. Now, it's all, it hasn't always been, you know, just straight and narrow because there are a lot of things that, that kind of try to persuade you every which way, you know. Still wanted to sing, so I pursued a singing career for a while, and, uh, you know, it just didn't pan out. And, uh, you know, a pastor doesn't make a lot of money, and so I pursued a professional career um, for a while, and, and it just seems that any time... I try to go a different direction that the Lord had me on. Um, the Lord always brings me back because, you know, this is what I was meant for. So now were you raised in a uh, Christian religious household? Is that why you were given the name Jeremiah or did they? Yeah, my okay. parents were, uh, were church planters when, okay. when we were little. And they planted uh, three churches in Indiana. And then when we moved back, um, when I was like in sixth or seventh grade, we moved to Kansas because all my parents' families are here. Mm -hmm. And when we moved back to Kansas, we uh, uh, started going to the Nazarene Church and just kind of been there ever since. Now let's talk a little bit more about uh, your music background. And you, you are a very talented musician, a singer. Uh, you play the drums, you play the piano, you play the guitar. Who knows what else that you're capable of? Are you a natural at this? Um, I didn't. I didn't think I was, because it, it's kind of like with a lot of stuff that that I've done in my life. I've never really been very good at a lot of things, but I've I've always been a very hard worker. And so once you decide that you want to do something and you work really really hard at it, you know you can make yourself look a little bit better than what your natural talent uh, really was. But I've had a lot of gracious people in my life uh, that have really helped me in that area as well. Um, uh, I, I learned to play guitar when I was 16, and uh, a guy in town uh, here by the name of Bill Chard, uh, he's the one that, that 
saw me with a guitar at I think it was um, oh the the Relay for Life. I was at Relay oh, for good. Life. I that that afternoon I'd just gone to a a thrift store and found a guitar that I bought for fifty dollars and <laughs> and I was walking around. I wasn't even tuned. I was just plucking, plucking nasty strings it. and. And he saw me out there, and he says, what do you got there? And I showed it to him, and he tuned it for me and showed me how to play a chord. And I played that one chord the whole night, just kept playing it over and over again. And he said, you should come to my house every Thursday, and we'll play guitar together. And that's what I did. And, and he showed me things that he plays in a certain way that nobody else ever plays. And uh, it's, it's pretty... Uh, um, he, it's pretty kind of, kind of a backwood style where you just... You know, you play the same thing, you just play it in a different way. And well, most songs are pretty much so built around three three chords. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it's just three chords. It just depends upon how you use them. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's fun. And we um, and and I played guitar for for a lot of years, and and then I decided that I wanted to learn other things because you know why not build your repertoire a little bit, and so I learned. Uh, drums, just kind of. I'm not very good at drums. I don't really have rhythm. That's the other thing about my musicianship is I can't, like, my my rhythm's just way off. I can't keep count. I can't keep <laughs> anything there. But yeah, so it was good. Uh, I had a lot of people. Dave Reinhardt was another one mm -hmm. uh, from the Baptist Church who was real gracious with me and taught me how to keep time and and at least another make it. Very talented musician. Yeah, he's very talented, and and he he actually taught me how to get around, like if I can't keep time, here's some ways how to fake keeping time to where if you're off, yeah. you, you can rely still on in. your bass player and your drummer to, to yeah. keep you on there time you go. in those regards. So exactly. you're all self-taught then for the most part? Uh, for the most part, yeah. Well, that, yeah. that's pretty impressive, very yeah. impressive. So <clears throat> you uh, you grew up here in Chinook then for mm -hmm. most of your life? Yeah. So you went to high school here, now what, did you go to private schools or public school? Went to public school. Okay, so you graduated uh, CHS, mm -hmm. and then you already knew that you were going to go to the ministry, so you mm -hmm. left right away and went to Olathe to yes. the Mid American Nazarene College. Mm -hmm. Now, was that a four year program? It so, was. Okay, so you didn't have to go to like a, a university, get a degree, and then go to. No, it's a Mid American Nazarene University is a liberal arts college, so they offer um, four year degrees in and you know wide scale and a wide variety of uh of degree options so majors and things like that so now was your family nazarene is that how what what made you decide to stay with go with this well the thing that was was since we went to the nazarene church uh the schools are the nazarene schools are actually very involved in all the local churches and so they have representatives that actually will go to local churches and and get to know the students and and really do a lot of PR work and on top of that they also have um, PR groups uh, that are like musician groups and they travel through throughout the year and throughout the summer uh, to local churches and they'll do specials and do uh, special events and concerts and things like that and uh, it just really gets a lot of uh, you know, public recognition to the schools. And so for me, it just, you know, I already had friends that were at the school. Um, I, you know, I'd been to the school uh, multiple times um, to play basketball and to, you know, do music. And yeah, I've heard they've got quite a sports program. They there. do, they do. And they're pretty proud of it. Uh, most of it is basketball. Mm -hmm. They were national champions three out of the four years I was Yeah, I, I think, was it last year? They actually made it up and were on ESPN and really? all that. It's pretty exciting. Yeah, yeah. It's a it's a it's a pretty happening place. Like it, it's it's an exciting school to be at. So they pretty much so recruit the younger uh, people for their ministry at a, right out of high school. Then, um, you know, <clears throat> they don't they don't particularly recruit uh, for the ministry. They re, they recruit students. You oh, know, for the college for the college. Okay. And so um, you know, they. Uh, all my friends, out of all my friends that, that I made at college, I was actually the only ministry major. Oh, you know, they okay. had, uh, my roommate was a business major. My other roommate was a, I don't remember what he did, but something similar to that, a uh, psychology major maybe, I don't know. Um, 
a friend of mine was a nursing major, another friend was a, you know, um, accounting major and math major, and and so they have all sorts of different degrees and programs. Um, and I was the only one that I knew uh, in my group of friends that were that was a ministry major, and so. So you had to go through just like a normal college would. You had your mm -hmm. basically your two years of core mm -hmm. classes, and yeah. and then your dedication towards what it is that you want to um, be. Yes, you know, that's your, correct. Your degree, as it will, or is it a degree, or mm -hmm. so it's like yeah. a Christian Science degree, or it's a Bachelor of Science, Bachelor of Science and in Christian with an emphasis of. Religion, of, yeah, divinity. So now did you studies. had to you had to learn all the different religions. I mean, do you speak Hebrew and and all that? No, usually that's a, that's something that goes deeper into like a master's. You're not gonna program. go that far, huh? Yeah, that's if you want to get into your doctorate and and all that kind of thing, and you have to actually go to Jerusalem and get approval and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, indeed, I've yeah. actually had friends have done that, and you know, I think that that's what's what is interesting about all that is that th that does have its place for for certain. Um, professions and for certain ministers or scholars or even philosophers who are, you know, um, ministering from that angle. Like there's definitely a place for that. Um, but, you know, when you're in the trenches and you're just, you know, ministering to people, um, the, you know, the best you know how, oftentimes those are just, you know, a little bit of extras that you have, but you won't use as much. Mm -hmm. You know, when you are, when you're just in everyday life, talking with everyday people like you and I, a um, whole lot of Hebrew and Greek don't really come up. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I, I can probably see, like, in your local coffee shop or Starbucks, you're, you're not going to really see that, that, yeah. that a lot there. Yeah. So you, you didn't have to study it and, and, and go through all that painstaking efforts to learn the language and read it and understand what it means, go through all the translations, just more of an overview and a basic understanding of where, where it came from. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And, that, and I actually, I think I opted out, I opted out of Greek in order to continue in Spanish. Oh. And so I remember um, you know, finishing up Spanish while I was there, so. And you came back to Chanute. Now, was this your first church? <clears throat> No. Uh -uh. Okay. No, I've been at several churches. I was at a church in Kansas City for two years and moved back to Chanute and ministered with uh, the Assemblies of God for about uh, about 10 years. And and now um, I've been here at the Nazarene Church for a little over one. It was actually one year this month. So you came in right around the same time as uh, Pastor Kevin did. <laughs> <laughs> like you did, yeah. He did. He uh, he came in between March and April, and and I came over in June, and and it was a really uh, it was a good move. It's a good move. Um, I'll be honest. When uh, you know the position that I was in um, over with the assemblies was was a good was a good gig, um, and I'd really uh, parts of me had really thought like, man, this is this is really it. Like this is what That's the one across the street. Correct. Okay. And so um, the, the whole... Christian Academy. Church. Yeah, with CCA. And the whole idea of, of you know, um, going and taking a position in a church across the street um, really wasn't even my idea. It was another one of those God movements where... It just um, felt right at the time. Well, it was really interesting because it was, it was a lot the same conversation I had when I was in the eighth grade um, because uh, one of my kids had a doctor's appointment and... I had just gotten home and nobody else was home yet and the baby was asleep and I had uh, the opportunity, this was in December, I had the opportunity to make a, you know, a cup of coffee and I go out and it was one of those warm December days where it's like about 50 degrees and so I put my hoodie on I go sit on the front porch with a cup of coffee and I felt this wind just kind of blow through and leaves went everywhere and, and all of a sudden I, I just felt in my heart the Lord say, you know, you're going to, I want you to go back over to the Nazarene church and minister over there. And I thought, are you crazy? <laughs> are you crazy? I said, I got a good thing going for me right here. Yeah. Everything that I... Take you out of your comfort zone now. Oh, exactly. And, and I looked at the situation that I was in at that time, which was, it was hurting pretty good. I don't know if, uh, if, if Pastor Kevin ever told you about um, where the church was before he came, but it was hurting. 
and uh, there was only yeah. there's less than 50 people there and, and yeah, they were man. looking at closing the doors and I thought I thought Lord how is this how is any good gonna come out of this and uh, but again well, change sometimes change is always good you oh know? yeah and Indeed. you know the, the church overall is suffering I mean if mm -hmm. there is a a true crisis in this country it's it's in the church mm -hmm. you know and uh, but you know <clears throat> I know that you're you're here this morning, and and uh, you got in here and you said, okay, we're doing the show. And you mentioned that you you wanted to be a country singer, and I don't know the name of this country singer, but you, you've always heard this term, uh, you know, when you do a show or Broadway theater, break a leg, whatever the case may be. Well, this country singer was doing a concert, I think Friday night or Saturday night, and he fell, and he broke his leg. Mm. And um, he never stopped the show. He was off, like he fell off the stage and he was laying flat on his back, still with the microphone in his hand, talking to the, the crowd and his, and his fans and his audience. And the paramedics are there and they're stabilizing him and they're getting ready to go. And he goes, oh no, we're not leaving until I'm done with my show. So they, they got him back up on the stage, they put him in a chair with his leg braced and propped up, and he finished that show with a broken leg. And then they later they showed the x-rays, and it wasn't just a, a fracture break or a little crack. I mean, the bone was supposed to be like, like this. Mm -hmm. It was like that. Wow. That's, that had to hurt. It had to hurt. But you know what? You go into shock. And and he didn't look like he was hurting. Yeah. You know, but then again, it's it's a frame of mind, you know, and it's just like your adrenaline is going and you got to go on, but you don't give up for your fans. You don't give yeah. up for, for God. You don't give up for the church. You, you got to keep going. Yeah. You got to go where it's at. And you had a rough morning today. <laughs> and, you know, and, and every everybody, I mean, you got a case of the Mondays or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever whatever it is. And. And um, you know, uh, to be to be honest with every you know, Pastor Kevin has, has got emergency situations that have come up. I filled in for him this morning. Uh, Jeremiah uh, has had his own share of emergencies this morning. Yeah. Um, but the, the real show today is about Father's Day. Yeah. And 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 <clears throat> recognizing your father uh, or fathers. Um, and in your case, uh, you were really put to that test this morning. I was, <laughs> definitely was. And um, you know, I probably won't go into as much detail as I did. You won't go into all the graphic detail as you did. You know, you, you might lose, <laughs> you might lose some viewers. Um, but it, it was tough. But there's a thing about people ask me all the time. You know, what does it mean to be a dad? What does it mean to be a dad? Um, and and you can get. You can get deep and talk about, you know, the, the philosophical side of everything and what does it really mean? And, and is a dad more than biology or is, is that all a dad is? And, and the thing that, that I always come back around to is a dad is simply somebody in your life who is willing to do whatever it takes to make sure that you are safe and you're headed in the right direction. I mean, really. Yeah. Now, in your household, um, I, I would consider you more of an untraditional style uh, in, in this society. Only by the nature is that you take on a heavy role, mm -hmm. not only in your personal life, your professional life, but also in your, your family life. We always see you around town doing stuff. Mm -hmm. You're doing the grocery shopping. You're taking care of the kids. Uh, you know, you're helping other people, you're volunteering over at Cherry Street, or you got a paintbrush in one hand and you got a kid in the other. Yeah, yeah. You know, you are a very busy dad. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, I think that, you know, I think that one of the things that people get so hung up over um, these days is, is whether or not, like, what is, what's right, what's not right when it comes to traditional um, parenting or traditional family and and the reality is, is that, you know, understanding 
that when um, when duty calls, you have to show up. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not it's not easy for especially in this area. It's not easy for people to live off of a one household income. No, and so it's not easy for us, and so that's why we can't. You know, when you got a family of six and and um, you know you have cars to pay for and you have a house to pay for and you have kids to pay for and all the stuff that they do to pay for and um, on top of everything else, like it, it takes uh, it takes more than just one person to carry that load. And um, you know, my wife, uh, she is she is strong. She's a strong woman, and uh, she's been working her whole life. And so the, even the idea of not working has never crossed her mind. And um, you know, and and so in that sense, um, traditionalism is kind of out the window. And and it, it comes to a place where it's just being willing to do whatever it takes to get the job done, and that's really what it, in essence, what it means to be a to be a family mm-hmm. is is we're we're going to do whatever it takes. And so, um, and I'm just going to be honest. My wife will tell you this too, that that uh, I am better at grocery shopping than she is, and and I am better at cooking than she is, and so. For what purpose, if if I am more skilled um, in you know in the store and in the kitchen than she is, what purpose would we be accomplishing and saying, well, no, that's a woman's job, so you need to learn to do it? There is no purpose in that. I'm just naturally better at that than she is because that's kind of been you know a focus that I've had over my life. I've always loved to cook. I've always loved to be frugal when shopping. You know, I know exactly what we need and what we need to get and how to get it and to get in and get out and, you know, and, and for her, she's naturally better at maintaining the checkbook than I am. And so, you know, she, she handles all of our budgeting because she's, she's just good and I'm not. It, what takes her 30 minutes takes me two hours. And so what purpose would that accomplish to say, no, that's a man's job to handle the finances? So you put, you, you pretty much have got a good balance of your time management. Oh yeah. You know, it's like what you're good at, what she's good at, you know, and fortunately, you know, you're in a position like most people where we can arrange our lifestyles to fit accordingly to what we want to do, how we want to do it, who's better at it. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, it's not like it used to be decades ago where the woman stayed home, didn't work, the man provided for everything and did all the labor. Um, So unless you're in in that type of a a culture um, or a specific religious sect, um, you have the freedom to actually move around and, and shift those adjustments and make those adjustments yeah and that's been you know I had a guy tell me one time that teamwork makes the dream work I like that that's and good. and so our dream was to have a big beautiful family and we have that and so in order to make that dream work that's going to take teamwork to make it happen and that's what we do and you like being a dad oh I love it I mean you like it so it. much that not only do you have, you know, your own child, children, but you take on foster children. You just adopted a baby. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a lot of undertaking. I mean, you it have is. to have a lot of love and commitment to want to do that. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, it's, and that's the funny thing is, is there's no difference. You know, a child's a child and dad's a dad. And, um, you know, I do love it. And, and in our case, um, you know, like you said earlier, we are very untraditional. But there's, it doesn't matter. Because I think that, I, I remember in the book of James, chapter 1, um, it says that, that, you know, if you think you're religious, think again. You know, if you think you're doing something right, think again. He said, true religion is this, is that you take care of uh, widows, but you also take care of orphans. And, um, you know, um, I think the responsibility as a dad far exceeds being a dad to your own kids. I think it, it extends to a place where you are willing to be a dad to anybody who needs a dad. And, 
and that's that's just kind of how we view things and um, so you know our home is open and um, you know with, with the kids that we have like you said I love it I'll come home and you know instead of plopping down in a lounge chair I'll just lay flat on the floor and and my kids will just come and you know crawl on me and jump on me and throw toys at me and and I love it and those are things that that we just love to do You're just like TV dad <laughs> not like TV <laughs> dad that's for sure that is for sure nothing yeah. like TV dad well what would you have to say to uh, less fortunate families I mean um, unfortunately in this country we have a lot of split families uh, we have a lot of fathers that are separated from their children for one reason or another. Uh, it may not be through mm -hmm. you know, a divorce or a family issue. It might be through work. It might be through the military. It could be through other unfortunate circumstances. Um, but it, it just seems that those values are losing its meaning. Mm -hmm. And... You know, everything seems to get blamed on the dad, regardless of the problem. The, 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 the child is out of control, the child gets into trouble, it's the dad's fault. But <clears throat> as, we, as we look at Father's Day, I think, to me, it, it's important just to understand for the father exactly what a father is, what it mm -hmm. means, um, and for the children that they brought into this world or they're caring for, that connection and that respect and that whole concept of putting all of those values together into whatever kind of a traditional style that it, you're comfortable with um, and, and choose to live by. Yeah. You know, not, not everybody, um, goes down the path of being a minister mm -hmm. uh, or a musician, a uh, TV producer, uh, whatever the path is that you do, we're all still the same human being. Mm -hmm. It's interesting you brought up that scripture one month ago uh, about um, <clears throat> you don't practice being religious or you don't practice being a Christian. You are. And that same philosophy is is used in the entertainment world when you, uh, you're when you go through acting classes mm -hmm. and i cannot remember who, who the famous actor was that walked in on an acting class one day and asked them what they were doing and they said we're rehearsing and he goes if you have to rehearse you're doing it wrong Actors just act. They, it's natural. Mm -hmm. If you have to rehearse at being a Christian, you're doing it wrong. Yeah. And that type of thing. Yeah, that's true. Final thoughts? My final thoughts, I would say this, especially about what you were talking about being um, traditional, as you know, like fathers kind of being absentee in the lives of people. There, there are two thoughts that I would give um, in this place, and that would be, uh, first of all, to the church, uh, recognize that that's part of uh, your calling um, as men in the church. Uh, throughout the book of Isaiah, uh, the theme over and over again uh, is, is strong that God says he is the father to the fatherless and that he desires to be a father to the fatherless. And if we, as imitators uh, of Jesus Christ, um, are going to truly live and reflect and be Christ to those um, in, our, in our neighborhoods and those in our communities, it is of the utmost importance that you understand that your role in your church is to be also a father to the fatherless, just like the Lord is to us. And so um, I would encourage you, church, to do this. If you see somebody in your church who is lacking a father figure, step up, men, and be that father figure to um, these children and, and be that for them. Uh, my second thought is this. If you're watching and you are lacking um, a father in your life, if you feel like you are just doing it alone 
and you don't know what it means to have a dad, you don't know what it means to respond to a dad or how a dad helps shape your life, I would encourage you, get to church. There was a lady that came in uh, to our office just this last week, and she said to us how uh, she felt lonely and that she had no friends and there was no one to talk to, and she didn't know what to do. And uh, so I encouraged her. I said, well, you'll find friends at church because that's where we find friends. And um, I'm telling you now, if, you are, if you're missing a father, man, come to church and there'll be somebody there for you. Because just like God is a father to the fatherless, uh, the men in our churches are going to be fathers to the fatherless. So it, whatever it is you're lacking and you're missing, um, the Bible tells us that we can find that in a community of believers. Um, you can check us out at the Church of the Nazarene um, at 1313 West 14th. It's right on the corner of uh, 13th, uh, 14th Street and Plummer. And we'd love to see you there. We'd love to be there uh, for you and with you. And uh, man, our doors are open. And uh, we just want to invite you to come in. So come see us. And there are. There, there, there's many different ways that, that people can become in, involved. You can become involved through your church. Uh, big Brothers, Big Sisters, mm -hmm. uh, Cherry Street Organizations, yeah. volunteer over at the Fire Escape. That's um, right. You know, just just be available. There, there, there's a lot of organizations that will openly welcome, you know, uh, role models and, and uh, people to help out as needed. But if you're... You know, like, like Jeremiah was saying, if you're watching this show and you feel lost in your youth, uh, turn to one of these programs and mm -hmm. uh, don't be afraid to just walk in and say hi and maybe just ask a couple questions or if you just need somebody to talk to. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of times that's all there is about it. Yeah. And don't mess around with crossing the wires on your video games and getting yourself stuck into a, 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 time, a warp. time warp that we have got to unravel by next week so that we can get this fixed. We'll get it. We'll do it. All right. Well, until then. All right. We'll see you next time. Ciao.